Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Building Disruptive Data and Analytics for Quality Improvement. Before we get started, I'd like to review a few housekeeping details. Today's webinar is being recorded and an online archive of today's event will be available a few days after the session. If you have trouble seeing the slides at any time during the presentation, please press F5 to refresh your screen on a PC or Command R if you're using a Mac. You may ask a question at any time during the presentation by typing your question into the Q&A box located on the right side of your screen and pressing Enter. And finally, I'd like to remind you of AHIP's antitrust statement located in the handout section at the bottom of your screen. The antitrust statement prohibits us from discussing competitively sensitive information. We're very fortunate to have with us today Mr. Jeff Springer and Shatang Patel. Jeff Springer is a Senior Vice President of Products and Solutions at Sidious Tech. He has more than 20 years of industry experience and has worked with leading healthcare technology vendors. Jeff holds a mechanical engineering degree and an MBA from the University of Pennsylvania Wharton School, where he graduated as a Palmer Scholar. Shatang Patel is Senior Healthcare Consultant at Sidious Tech. He has 15 years of experience spanning healthcare management and health policy making settings with a focus on payer strategy, business operations, and supporting technologies. Shatang holds a master's degree in health services administration from the University of Michigan. At this time, I would like to turn the floor over to our speakers. Thanks very much, Lisa. And um, as we start our webinar here, this is Jeff, by the way, so you can recognize our voices. Shatang will uh, speak shortly as well. We want to talk about why we're talking about disruption uh, in quality and why it's relevant now. And so as we start our webinar, we'll, we'll go through the changes that have been impacted in the industry, and you'll start to see why disruption will become more and more important. As we look at all of those changes and the breadth depth of those changes, you'll see that taking a business as usual approach will uh, not lead to the types of results that you have to get to. As we think about the disruption, you have to think about both technology, people, and process. We'll go through the technology pieces, but then also the implication on people and process as a result of that. And then we'll go into the key takeaways of what you can take back to your organization, how you should think about it, not just for right now, but for the next year or five years as we take that out. So as we start our webinar, what we wanted to do was get a little audience participation as we go into this. And we're gonna start off with a polling question I'll turn it over to Shatang uh, so you can tell the difference in our voices, and we'll go through our first Great. polling question. Thanks, Jeff, and good morning, everyone. Pleasure to speak with you all virtually. Uh, and Monica, if you could please read out our question. And just to preface the question, uh, we understand that most organizations uh, prioritize all these four options that you have uh, in the question, but what we wanted to understand was what is the number one priority for you today uh, so, Monica, if you could please read the question. Thank you. The poll will appear on the top right-hand side of your screen, so go ahead and click out of full screen mode in order to see this, the poll pop up. And it reads, which of these is the most important priority to generate efficiencies across HEDIS, STAR, and quality management functions, and potentially across other enterprise functions like network management? And you have four choices, clinical data integration, which is collection and use of key clinical attributes, there's member engagement and experience. There's artificial intelligence technologies for prescriptive analytics and provider performance and contracting. So of those four choices, just choose one. Again, the question is, which of these is the most important priority to generate efficiencies across HEDIS, STAR and quality management functions, and potentially across other enterprise functions like network management? And we'll give it just a few moments before we close the polling out. And we appreciate your answers and your feedback. Okay, so it looks like everyone has answered, and I'll turn it back to you for the results. So, Tank, back to you. Great. So, in terms of results, uh, Jeff, uh, we have 65% uh, responses uh, prioritizing clinical data integration. That's our number one priority of the four options that we're given. Yeah, and it's interesting, uh, Shitang, that 
such a wide disparity. So 65%, way more than half, uh, value that clinical data integration over member engagement experience, AI or provider performance. Um, and I actually think that this makes sense as we evaluate how does clinical data help to drive the real answers uh, to the questions of where am I on my measures? Um, uh, this strategy makes sense, and, and especially in light of some of the other changes that are going on in, in the industry. So as we go into those other changes in the industry, I think it's important to look at these key trends. And as we talk about these key trends, we'll point back to the clinical data integration um, point that everybody is largely focused on that. So the first trend that we're seeing is a shift towards member experience in terms of the quality measures that are out there. So away from clinical quality to measure experience um, and uh, treating the measures more like a feedback loop for how did I feel my care was, how did my provider do, how did uh, the coordination happen, how did the payer respond to uh, questions and answers that I had. All of these things are experiential in nature. And as we see in the measure balancing scorecards, more and more of the measures will shift to this type of experience. And as we think about gathering the data, gathering the experience around, uh, around member experience, that becomes a much harder and harder uh, thing to even gather the data, let alone to influence their experience. So we'll talk about some of the data that you need um, to help with a member experience shift, um, but also then uh, to influence that shift as well. As we talk about the measures, you can't ignore the Zikita's timeline shift as well. So this year, the measure timelines were exactly the same, but starting next year, um, all of the guidance will come out about five, six months earlier. Um, the measures are already out. The guidance, I think, comes out in June next year for HEDIS, which means that the measures that are going to get used will be in place long before the end of the year. Um, which has been the experience of HEDIS for many, many years. And so as we shift that timeline forward, this gives us the opportunity to be more prospective in how we approach the measures um, and be more collaborative. And as we think about not just HEDIS, then other programs, value-based, pop health, um, other operational uh, initiatives, it gives the ability to align these things. And NTQA has tried to give the ability to align these things with um, the ability to modify the rules as well so they're more clinically based uh, or more relevant for contracts. Clearly this year has been unusual, uh, so the rise in telehealth uh, is, is very clear. Uh, people aren't going to their providers as much. Uh, clearly uh, COVID will get into the pandemic and the impact of the pandemic, but telehealth was worth calling out. Getting the data from uh, uh, telehealth and some of the measures being uh, telehealth measures uh, will also have an impact. So this shifts not just the types of measures, the type of uh, impact, but also uh, the types of communication that are going on there between payers, providers, uh, and the members themselves. Shifting the mem uh, measures Jeff, from, yep. Sorry, I, I, I would just add one thing in terms of rise of telehealth, right? Just because of everything else going on along with the pandemic, I think the concept that where care is delivered is shifting significantly and, and not just how, right? So when you think about Walmart and area and, and CVS, the companies or uh, pharmacies that are opening up clinics, uh, the delivery setting itself is changing. There are a lot of retail clinics uh, that are going to be out there over the next five to 10 years. And how we manage that, uh, and especially in terms of preventive care, will be significant with that shift in delivery setting. Yep, I think that's a great point, Shatong. As we as we think about that, along with the member experience shift, consumerism will become more and more important, and where that care is delivered. And as companies like the WalMarts of the world, which are used to dealing with uh, customer experience as one of their primary goals. It creates a very interesting dynamic of how do you manage members, how do they manage patients, how do you make sure that experience is a positive experience going forward. This next one, the shift to digital uh, measures is, be is going to become more and more prominent. So uh, clearly we see NCQA pushing uh, forward with this. So how do we do uh, the digital ECDS measures? 
uh, making sure the measurement of those uh, can be automated. And so as we think about the collection of this data um, and digitizing it becomes more and more important, which leads right into the next uh, measure, the fire-based uh, measures the collection of this data. Uh, regulatory changes, both on the payer side and the provider side, are making fire more and more standard. It gives us the opportunity to collect that data in different ways. But then fire can also provide a different mechanism for how the communication occurs. So this enables a real-time communication that couldn't exist there before. So between these two things, could we go as far as saying chart chase doesn't need to exist anymore? And clearly that's a very large step, but as we talk about the strategies, we want to create a vision, but then create one step at a time towards that. And then the elephant in the room of almost every room is how does the pandemic affect uh, everything healthcare related, but then also um, affect HEDIS, affect uh, quality uh, in general. One of the big impacts uh, around the pandemic on payers is twofold. One is clearly there's been a large layoff in the American population, so benefits are down uh, from a payer's perspective. But then also patients' members aren't utilizing as highly, so they're not going to the hospitals, they're not going to their providers. Um, so the medical use is also down. And in the world where the medical cost ratios have to reach certain, certain thresholds for certain programs, 80 or 85%, depending on the program, that medical loss ratio miss will force payers to give money back to their beneficiaries that are out there. And so with lowering utilization, with lowering beneficiaries, these all will hit uh, uh, different programs within here. And that cost reduction that uh, will need to occur, that means more automation, which will then drive this shift as well. So if yeah. we look across all of these things, Really, there are three key things uh, that we should look at as we uh, look at them uh, to really unlock your data, to create automation. And really, it's becoming not just a single step towards disruption, but almost a mandate towards disruption. Yep. Yeah, and Jeff, one, one point I would make regarding uh, the MLR utilization piece. Uh, the trends we have seen, the utilization is not as low as it was in June, July timeframe. The utilization has ticked up. Uh, a lot of plans are reporting in the mid 80s or at least the low 80s, if not closer to mid 80s. However, due to uncertainty of the next few months and how the winter is going to affect the uh, uh, kind of utilization across the board, uh, it's still a pretty, pretty prevalent issue for sure as far as how to address your MLR shortcomings if it goes that route. Now, as Jeff mentioned, right, so in general, we're talking about an environment uh, that, that is fairly uncertain, not only in terms of the pandemic, but also in terms of there could be policy shifts uh, post-November uh, elections. So there is a lot of different types of disruption, disruption that's happening. Uh, we talked about vertical integration with retail clinics. Uh, so it's both organic, inorganic, uh, environmental, internal, however you want to put it. Uh, how do you really channel all this disruption, all this change, and 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 kind of get what you still want out of this, which is improving outcomes and improving your bottom line? So there are a few things that we focused on in these three examples. One primary underlying theme is the concept of efficiency. Uh, because of all this uncertainty, uncertainty, I should say, uh, what we feel uh, plans are really focused on is how to become more and more efficient across my business processes, across my departments, uh, and also in the process, improve stakeholder satisfaction. How do you achieve both? So we try to focus on examples that can address that core concept of efficiency. The first one we'll dive into is NLP, what we are calling Unlock Your Data. And per Gardner and IDC, there's nearly 80% of data that exists on a member that is in unstructured format, or at least up to 80%, depending on how much data a given payer may have. Uh, so this yeah, is a significant some, area. On, yes, please. On this one, if you're related back to the feedback that the audience gave us, that <laughs> yeah. um, this is you know the key issue, how do we co uh, collect the data? This becomes really the core issue of the first step of how do you unlock that data? How do you gather that data? 
Um, and so this, this really is pointing towards the focus uh, of the folks attending the webinar that this is the key question. Absolutely. And even if you see major trends of, of successful health plans, those that are four star or higher on the MA side or just performing well on the commercial side from an enrollment standpoint, one thing that they have is a very robust and rich supplemental data feed. Uh, collecting that clinical information from various sources, not just one source. So we'll absolutely dive into that. Uh, the second example that we have picked, and again, kind of uh, focused on that theme of uh, efficiency, is around member segmentation. Traditionally, this has also been known as risk stratification. We're trying to avoid avoid that terminology. But essentially here, what we're talking about is segmenting your customers and determining how to attack each of those kind of cohorts, right, that have some common set of characteristics. Um, and this this kind of approach of segmenting your customers has been su successful in various industries, not just healthcare, but it becomes uh, even more important in healthcare to properly do member segmentation simply because each individual's care continuum is going to be different. Jeff and I may both have three different chronic conditions, but based on a lot of other factors, we are going to have a different care continuum individually uh, than someone with the same three uh, same three chronic conditions. So how do you use AIML to really understand those clinical nuances as well as behavioral nuances to properly understand a given cohort and then uh, manage that cohort moving forward and ultimately get to delivering right care at the right time at that care continuum? So we'll talk about that piece. And then the third example that we're going to dive into is speeding up your insights or how to attain real-time insights. Ideally, here we're talking about real-time care coordination, which uh, I know some of you may be laughing, is a pipe dream, but we are already starting to see bits and pieces of how those real-time insights can come together and, and truly uh, enable and ultimately get to that real-time coordination of care, especially for, for uh, those, uh, those patients that have uh, chronic conditions and those patients that are part of value-based contracts. I think there's a lot of a lot of room there uh, to improve, but at the same time, we will talk about a couple examples for those real-time insights. With that, let me let's get to one more question. So here we're specifically trying to understand how you're leveraging data science and advanced analytics today. Again, the, the options are going to be similar to the ones you saw in the, in the previous poll question. But uh, Monica, over to you uh, in terms of reading out the question. Thank you. Again, the polling question will appear on the top right-hand side of your screen. Go ahead and click out of full screen mode in order to see the polling area. And the poll reads, which of the below areas uh, present the largest opportunity for your organization to leverage data science and advanced analytics. So our answers are data collection or capture, uh, performance measurement, what and how to measure the uh, and generate insights, member segmentation for timely engagement, and provider-related process workflows, for example, provider contracting chart chase. So those are the four options. Again, the question is, which of the below areas present the largest opportunity for your organization to leverage data science and advanced analytics? So go ahead and choose one. We certainly appreciate your feedback. So we'll pause for just a moment while we still have many people answering. Much And what I will do is turn it back to um, Mr. Tang and Jeff for you to discuss the results. Thank you. Great. Just awaiting the results here, Jeff. Jeff, any guesses what the answer is going to be? Well, I, I cheated Shatong, so I've already looked at the answers. <laughs> so uh, awesome. I don't think that I could uh, uh, guess. But, you know, based on uh, the first question, I would have guessed that uh, data collection, because um, gathering the supplemental data was such a high priority, but that data collection would be the highest one. Um, and it is, uh, but it is not as much skewed as the first answer was. So in the first answer, supplemental data collection was 65% uh, uh, the priority. But here, data collection and performance management are almost equally um, yep. uh, given the answers of what the audience is looking for. Um, so we're starting to see it's not just the collection of the data from 
this perspective, but the what to do about it. How to how do you impact uh, the results based on that, uh, which which makes sense because once you collect the data, you have to do something with it. And how do you do it? And with limited resources, limited processes, you have to do what's what's the smartest thing. Um, so this is this is making sense to me in terms of how I would think about it from a strategic perspective. What about you, uh, Shatang? Yeah, and, and just not, for the sake of not repeating, I would also say 22% for uh, member segmentation and timely engagement. Very interesting. Uh, I'm, I'm a little biased toward this particular answer, but uh, certainly I would expect that to go up over the next few years in terms of, as, as to your point again earlier, right, as we get to consumerism and more and more of that behavioral economics approach, I think uh, that that answer may, may be a little different two, three years from now. So, uh, but interesting nonetheless. Yeah, definitely. So let's let's dive in and look at um, unlocking your data first. So this is our first thing of how do we help you to get more value out of your data. So let's let's talk about NLP um, or even uh, the collection of that data for just a second. So as Su Tong said, there is a huge amount of unstructured data still out there. So 50 to 80 percent, and we're just talking in the clinical records. And in response to the question, it was collecting clinical data. Um, but as we start thinking about um, uh, member um, sediment, clinical data won't be the only kind of data we're collecting. We're going to start collecting more uh, psychosocial data or maybe even social media data to help to drive uh, answers to those questions. And that's 100% unstructured. But as we Think about NLP. NLP is uniquely suited to um, get insights out of unstructured data. And so how this could help clearly is to answer specific questions. Um, so I'm going from top left to right first. The simple way is I collected some uh, supplemental data, whether it's a chart or even a CCDA or a fire resource. And in the notes there, uh, doing the abstraction, that abstraction via NLP can save me a lot of time. Um, so that becomes a simple productivity step um, that is easy to understand. Um, the harder thing is how do I identify hidden value in this? And so uh, I get a chart or I get some other record and maybe, you know, five years from today we're collecting social media data around this. And what are the things that uh, the data tells me that I wouldn't do or wouldn't chase because I don't have a, a particular chase around it? So whether it's from a risk, a HEDIS, a quality uh, perspective, identifying new opportunities. Um, one of the uh, best examples that I, I know about this is uh, risk of heart attack can be judged, uh, one of the best risks of heart attack can be judged based solely on social media data. And that's not necessarily a measure example, but it is a clinical example. And as we start collecting member, member sentiment more and more, we'll find these types of examples in the data uh, that's out there and be able to collect and drive answers to them. So that hidden value in terms of what are the measures that are out there are, are very important. And then the last one is the is that sediment analysis. So uh, as you uh, want to collect member sediment, driving leading indicators on that uh, really is a whole new type of data that's out there and being able to understand it, shift through it is really um, something that you need to unlock through automated uh, purposes. You can't have uh, EDWs, analytics around that, you need to be able to uh, segment that data with NLP. And so as we look at NLP, it's not just a one-time thing, it's going to be a broader strategy and, you know, two, three, five years from now, it'll get used more and more heavily. So the way we're thinking about this is it's got definitive use cases today uh, that you can get value out of, but also need a strategy for tomorrow. Uh, around this. So this is one of those things where having a strategic approach is going to be more and more important. Yeah. And Jeff, just to uh, emphasize that point, uh, most of these algorithms uh, are unique to a given use case, right? For example, algorithms are specifically built to just extract uh, diagnosis codes or just extract, extract procedure codes. Similarly, they could be built just to extract additional demographic information or additional information on behavioral health components or mental health components. So just what we have seen quite a bit in the industry is a lot of folks have invested in NLP, but when they invested in it, they only did it for one specific use case 
So to scale it and leverage it across to gain these efficiencies that we're talking about is something that people have been uh, unable to do, or at least not able to do as easily as they originally thought. So very important to remember that, that each algorithm uh, is built for a specific use case and you can ideally make a mechanism or build a mechanism to have multiple such algorithms to truly extract all the power and unlock all the power of this unstructured data. Yeah, good point, Shadon. Excellent. So as we look at uncovering the value of NLP, and as Shadon said, it, it starts with a use case or two where there's clear efficiency to be gained or clear value to be gained, um, but then also having that long-term approach towards how does this plug into my broader strategy? So as you collect your clinical data, uh, collect your supplemental data, uh, even start collecting social um, media data or social data, how do you leverage that? But this uh, scenario is really around some of the first steps towards it. And so as you collect, whether they're standard clinical formats like a CCDA or a FHIR or uh, charts which are truly unstructured that are out there, you're going to process them through. And typically what happens today is they're workflow that uh, segments and touches those and determines what it is and the people have to do that. But if you um, have a chart that supports more than one measure, so typically when you're collecting a chart, you're focused on a question. The question might be HEDIS or risk or value-based, but I'm going to see if that member is compliant on X. Um, uh, do they have a, uh, a BMI or do they have a, uh, an ABA1C test? Do they have XYZ? Whatever it might be. As that chart comes in, clearly it could support more than one thing. And identifying based on that chart, hey, I've got these two, three, five additional measures which might be applicable. And it might be applicable not just in the program that I'm in, but across programs. So I collected a chart for HEDIS and it might also be applicable for risk or apl applicable for value. Um, creating that additional value can increase compliance across the board. Um, many programs collect charts year round. How do you leverage those, use those year round and identify new opportunities out of them? Similarly, I might collect a chart and I go down here for um, charts three and five. I collect a chart and I think that it's applicable for this measure because that's what my chase intelligence or whatever you call it, algorithms have told me. But when I look at that chart and do the abstraction or the coding on that chart, it does not answer that question. Now, if I have a mechanism to stand between the person doing the abstraction, doing the coding, doing the analysis of that chart, and the question of does it add that value, I can avoid a number of steps. So the efficiency of uh, the NLP in this case of evaluating, hey, this chart is not going to be helpful for you in answering that question can create the efficiency for the people who are looking at charts that can have value out there. So there's both a higher compliance that can be uh, gathered around this of identifying new opportunities as well as an increased efficiency around these. And as your measures become a broader range of measures, both of these things will become more and more important. So think back to that um, uh, member sediment type question, the ability to collect data that helps to define that member sediment uh, will become more and more varied. So that's, you know, a strategy two, three uh, years away, starting with a strategy around known things, around uh, whether it's clinical quality or operational or even financial uh, type questions is things that you can start with today, but then expand in the future to the point that Shatan was making. Now with that, we'll go to our third question. Yep, so before we go into the next example, I did want to bring up another poll question. So as you can imagine, there are a lot of different types of AI ML models, including the examples that Jeff just brought up for NLP. Uh, and a lot of these models are also built specifically to understand consumer behavior. So knowing and understanding uh, that, or keeping that in mind, uh, do you think, uh, actually, Monica, if you can just read the question, please. Certainly. Thank you. Again, the poll will appear on the right-hand side of your screen. Just make sure you're out of full-screen mode in order to see it. And the question reads, do you think AI ML models can have inbuilt biases? And if so, what might cause such models to be uh, such models be biased against? What might such models be biased against? 
So do you think AI ML models can have inbuilt biases? And if so, what might such models be biased against? And your answers are models cannot be biased, or race and ethnicity, or gender, or regions, urban versus rural. So go ahead and choose one of those answers. So do you think AI ML models can have inbuilt biases? And if so, what might such models be biased against? Go ahead and choose your answer, and I will turn it back to you, Shuteng and Jeff. So Shuteng, without uh, looking at the answer, um, what do you think is going to be uh, the biggest one here that uh, sees the biases, or the none, none at all? Uh, so yeah, I can you hear me okay, Jeff? Yep, I hear you now. I so I I'm not sure if people are aware of how biased these models can truly be. Um, so I think, and if they are aware, uh, the fact that they can be biased regionally is because of geographic variance uh, in the U.S. healthcare system. Uh, maybe that's the top answer. I'm not sure. But let's see what the answers are. So we see a, a huge skew here towards race and race and ethnicity biases uh, in the models. John, what do you think about that? Well, actually, there has been a lot of studies done uh, on this particular uh, subject. In fact, uh, the answer is there is inherent bias, uh, specifically uh, in terms of race and ethnicity in majority of the AI ML models that are out there. Um, one study by statnews.com, I just want to make sure I credit them, found that racial bias can produce huge differences in assessing patients' needs for special care, especially uh, special care to manage conditions such as hypertension, diabetes, and depression. Um, a lot of times uh, in these models, zip codes are used uh, to, again, uh, due to uh, high correlation, uh, or whatever the reasons, uh, zip codes are a prevalent uh, variable, uh, and especially in terms of determining access to care, uh, in terms of determining uh, access to just overall uh, the kind of lifestyle, quality of life, uh, and they can put in inherent biases as a result. Uh, so there's a lot of work happening. Uh, people are actually uh, specifically creating initiatives to understand uh, how these biases can be taken out of the models, not only in terms of understanding the consumer, but also in terms of improving their health. So I think that's the piece that <laughs> ultimately this is still about improving health outcomes and quality outcomes. So a lot of work being done, a lot of specific strategic initiatives being taken to make sure uh, this bias is taken out of these models. So let, let me uh, actually expound on that a little bit more in our next example around member segmentation uh, and how uh, member segmentation can can be done a little bit differently, especially uh, disruptively when you think about all the different components that are out there. So one big reason why member segmentation, again, uh, you can call it risk gratification, however you want to coin it, but uh, a big promise uh, doing AI or ML-driven member segmentation is the ability to use a lot of different data sources. So conducting multidimensional uh, analysis uh, that incorporates clinical, financial, operational data all together across the organization uh, can produce a lot of action-oriented analytics. Uh, the other element of this is sound segmentation always relies on quantitative data as well as qualitative data sets. Uh, and qualitative data sets uh, can have more nuanced uh, analysis, right, around patient characteristics, social behavioral issues, geographical biases, clinical judgment, member willingness. Uh, these are all elements that are more qualitative in nature. Uh, so you have to have the ability to use both. Traditionally, what has happened is it's either only been a clinical uh, criteria or a very traditional rules-based criteria that has uh, helped in creating these cohorts and conducting overall population health management. But the idea here is to use way more than just clinical data uh, and crunch it to build proper cohorts that you can, you can manage accordingly. 
some, some high level other examples around how this can be done, segmenting members based on their probability of engagement, uh, the improving communications and customizing messages uh, based on uh, specific channels of communication, uh, reducing overall switching of members across plans because of lack of communication, providing better value uh, to patients and an improved experience, uh, evaluating providers on a consistent basis, uh, and then again, developing strategic partnerships uh, with your stakeholders, especially your data exchange partners to collect more data and do more targeted selection. Um, ultimately, when you think about AIML and population health management together, uh, the goal is on your bottom right, which is precision medicine. Again, deliver right care at the right time um, for, uh, well, usually it's for the right cost, but. We're, we're not going to think about the cost piece. Uh, we're only going to think about right care at the right time for the sake of uh, population health management principles. Uh, so let's get into the detail, a little bit more detail on how this can be achieved. So the example we have chosen here uh, is for segmenting a high risk population into relevant cohorts. And here, uh, by high risk, we're talking a population uh, where everybody at least has three or four uh, chronic conditions. And this is where, uh, and again, we have used this example for a specific reason to prove the point about precision medicine. Uh, traditionally, such segmentations, as I mentioned, uh, is based on just the number of conditions uh, or a assigned risk score or other other rules that, uh, that uh, kind of break the population down into certain cohorts. Utilizing AI ML algorithms, however, uh, whether it's regression models, uh, all the way to classification models with supervised machine learning, what you can do is you can analyze a given population at a significantly more granular level. And with this approach, uh, the, the following steps uh, are taken typically to, to understand and build a propensity score uh, for a given membership. So first, uh, we build multiple regress regression models that are based on combination of chronic conditions. Examples uh, that are uh, included here it could be CKD and cancer, or just uh, kind of multiple heart diseases. It could be rheumatoid arthritis and malnutrition. There are a number of different ways, depending on the population, that you can uh, put the, the conditions or the combination of conditions together. Uh, second, we add other inputs based on member historical information, demographic information, or any other qualitative data sets that a given plan could have. And classification models are built, which crunch all the possible patterns, uh, based on various conditions. And then what happens is you get an output that is not just based on, uh, you know, a set of given conditions, but it's actually an individual score for a given member with, with the background and the premise of all those chronic condition combinations. So how urgently do I engage with a given member based on all the aforementioned information that we talked about and that prioritization of members, giving each member a propensity score with relevant interventions is critical uh, to really address a high-risk population. So again, going from a traditional cohort-based to individual member score-based segmentation, uh, and then figuring out based on that individual score, grouping them and attacking them appropriately to engage with them and improve their outcomes can, can deliver significant uh, benefits. So I will pause there, Jeff. I don't know if you wanted to add anything here. Uh, I know it was a little bit uh, uh, kind of long-winded, but uh, any, <laughs> any any comments here? Yeah. Um, no, I found that uh, very interesting, Shatong. The, the piece that uh, I'll emphasize of what you talked about is the concept of precision medicine. And so as we think about what happens today in either care management or quality um, uh, around these types of things is you create these segments of, hey, here's my diabetics, here's my asthmatics, and let me do X for them. But when you break it down to a member level, the variability in care that each individual member has can create a very different next step member by member. And the only way to really drive that kind of program where you're individualizing recommendations um, care, education, engagement at that level is through this type of automation. And as you add in all of the different segments that you could look at around this, and we talked about race and, and ethnicity, um, but there's a number of other dimensions that can drive 
the impactability or the engagement from the member, really the goal here is to move the members towards quality, towards uh, lower cost, and doing that at an individual member level becomes the goal, starting with a program that enables this type of thought. And then you can start with clearly programs around segments that are most impactful, um, getting to the long-term goal of making it to precision of one uh, really requires that strategic view of how to set up this program to run that type of uh, um, data and to be able to create those interventions in an automated way. So with that, Chitang, why don't we go to our next uh, poll question? Yep, and, and just based on uh, kind of the example you heard, uh, we wanted to understand uh, from your perspective how have you done member segmentation to date? Uh, so, Monica, if you could please read the question. Thank you. Again, the poll will appear on the right-hand side of your screen next to your slides. Make sure you're out of full screen mode in order to see it and participate in it. And the poll reads, how do you conduct member segmentation today? Most prevalent use case in your organization? And the choices are rules-based member cohorts, for example, risk score, chronic conditions, or other. Second choice is propensity-based member cohorts, uh, ability to effectively engage bases based on member historical information. And the third choice is propensity-based member cohorts, ability to effectively engage uh, based on uh, attributed provider. So those are your three choices. And once again, the question reads, how do you conduct member segmentation today? And what is the most prevalent use case in your organization? We'll pause for just a moment while we assemble all of these answers, and we certainly appreciate your feedback. And Tang and Jeff, I will turn it back to you. Thank you. Yeah, so Shitang, as, as folks are uh, answering that next uh, question, why don't we go uh, start our next section, and then we'll come back to the poll answers, uh, and we can review that, because I think these two concepts are intertwined. Yep. Um, so the third area is speeding up your insights. So as we talked about in the last uh, section of improving segmentation or even getting down to segmentation uh, of one, the question becomes how do you engage with members and providers and it's separate types of engagement. And you want to uh, out, uh, tune your outreach efforts to make them more effective. And so if you're truly going to get da down to segmentation of one, the engagement efforts have to be really uh, precise in terms of how is the best way to do outreach. And clearly, you're not going to do outreach to every member um, person to person, um, but creating some automation around that and understanding from a person to person outreach, whether it's a quality uh, or care uh, type outreach, making sure that it's most impactful. And so as you think about what the best outreach program is, the best outreach mechanism, understanding what the predicted compliance will be. So what will a member do? What will a provider do if you do nothing? Or if you provide just education or uh, guidance? Or if you uh, then do outreach and communication around them? And self-serve will become more and more important, but clearly some folks, payers and providers, both need hand-holding. So who are the ones that will move the needle the most? Who are going to be the most impactful? Where can you lower your cost and improve your quality the best? In terms of uh, the chart management, uh, streamlining your uh, tasks here to be where can you be most effective will be clearly one of the key questions of who will have those charts, who will have that data, how can you collect it most easily, uh, improve your results, but then also from a fire-based intervention, this is where it really can get to real-time. Even if you wanted to do real-time around some things today, the, your partners, the providers, and the data that you would need for the members wouldn't be available, but with the regulatory changes with fire, this is starting to become more and more possible. And so as you think about this and the ability to do these things more precisely and then getting to real time. I point to the quote at the bottom, uh, Gartner saying there will be a 5x increase in streaming data and analytics infra infrastructures. This really points to the fact that those cohorts that we talked about in the last time will become smaller and smaller 
and uh, eventually get down to cohorts of one. And so we've got to go through all of these different things in terms of engagement strategies, uh, prediction about where the best and how the best way to engage are, streamlining our current processes, and then really getting uh, to real time around these things. So uh, with that said, let's go back to our poll results and look at uh, the last poll that we had. So 67% said uh, based on rules-based, and then 27% based on a propensity-based uh, number of cohorts, uh, and 7% propensity-based cohorts based on attributed providers. So interestingly, rules-based still is the most, most prevalent way to uh, segment your membership and your, and your customer base uh, to understand how to manage them. And, and Shitang, as you think about this answer, what value and or risk does having a rules-based approach have towards um, a long-term strategy around uh, driving that type of engagement? Certainly, I think, uh, so rules-based approach, obviously there's, there's, uh, there's a lot of value uh, in a number of different functions that, that you know, traditionally happen or typically happen in a given, given payer. The, the issue is we are also starting to have a lot more data on our hands, especially clinically nuanced data, right? Um, ever since ICD-10 um, was introduced, uh, the amount of clinical nuance that we now understand that's documented on given members is significantly larger. And what these traditional rules-based components, they, they miss in the process is capturing that clinical nuance or it's only captured via risk score published by CMS based on ACCs or whatever it may be. Um, so I think that's where the limitation uh, truly lies. So I would be curious uh, to see, especially uh, because when it comes to engaging a member or a member taking ownership of their health, how they're gonna do that is something that's important to understand both clinically speaking and behaviorally speaking. So. Uh, I would be curious how this how this uh, evolves uh, over the next few years and as we get more and more into consumerism. Yeah, and I, I would I would agree. I think the rules based approach can definitely help with known patterns and prevalent patterns. Um, but as we get down to nuanced variations in care based on really sub cohorts that are out there, rules based approach becomes very difficult to maintain. And the dynamic nature of both the member patients care. Um, so what happens if they have a new diagnosis? What happens if they have um, a new attribute that pops up? What happens if they go to a new provider? It becomes very dynamic and the variations and how you drive that next step for the member, for the provider around that member uh, really needs more of that dynamic type approach to how do you then engage uh, with that member. So I think rules definitely provide a base value. So the base of Maslow's pyramid is good, but as you get to this true engagement at a, a smaller and smaller um, cohort uh, of patients, you need something that's gonna be more dynamic than that. And especially with fire yeah. coming and being able to collect the data uh, um, exactly. faster. And that's gonna be the difference is today you have data and not only in terms of richness, quality, uh, but in terms of speed, uh, way faster than you waiting for that claim lag is how do you take advantage of it? You got it. Yep. And so if we think about how do you manage those populations and then drive insights, when we're looking at a population and any population you're looking at, you're going to start with uh, the 10,000 foot view. Of what is the population that I'm targeting? What's the problem? So here we're looking at a rheumatoid arthritis management uh, population and you've got a target population and we'll call that the 100% uh, population that you have out there. And then uh, the question from that population is, who do you need to engage with? And how will that engagement then help improve their care? And so first of all, uh, the first question is, if you did nothing, um, who would be uh, compliant? And so that's gonna take off a percentage of the population. Um, this scenario, 20% of the population are gonna be compliant um, uh, without your doing anything. Then the next question is, who's going uh, to take the next right step in their care for the processes that they should have? So who's gonna visit a rheumatoid arthritis 
uh, in the next six months and who's going to engage properly with their provider around that. And it's going to be a smaller population of that. And then there's a question of who can afford the drugs, who's going to um, uh, maintain their um, drug regimen, who's going to eat well is a smaller population. And then the question becomes, if you did an outreach, who is engageable? Who can you move along the lines of improving both their food and drug uh, behavioral habits around that? And as you think about this question, when you start with a whole overall population, if you treated that overall population all the same, clearly some of that population will be impactable and some won't. Um, and if you then think about the impactable portion of the population, which is much smaller, where um, you can actually move the needle on them taking care of themselves and improving their quality and uh, their, their cost, that's where you want to spend your resources, your time, your effort. Clearly, it's not the only way to do outreach to these. Clearly, you want to try to educate the others through automated ways where it's not high touch. Um, but having a focus operationally around uh, members that are impactful uh, really can create the right outcomes for you and your organization. So as we look at this, each one of the measures, each one of the metrics that you're going to look at is going to be a process. Mr. Chang, if you walk us through this process for um, our uh, lady in the middle around RA and how would we engage with this lady and help to improve our care? Certainly. And, and, and this is a, a good example where you're incorporating both AI ML based components as well as rules based components. And, and this obviously could be the reality for the foreseeable future is doing a combination. So the best way to read the slide is counterclockwise starting at 12 o'clock. Um, so uh, number one, two, and three are, are uh, items that are more preventive in nature, but they have the AI ML components. So predicting cases for RA, uh, <laughs> one of my favorite lines in data science is chronic conditions don't happen overnight, they happen over time. So the more history you have, the more probability or the higher the probability that you'll be able to predict something more accurately. And it is absolutely true in the case of chronic conditions. So predicting cases for RA based on historical information is one model that can be utilized. Uh, another more specific model could be not only based on uh, the probability that you're going to have RA, but the probability that uh, you would uh, your propensity to take a prescribed drug, right? Because in RA, the way to close the gap, uh, gap is to have a DMARC drug prescribed. But what is what is the probability that you'll be non-compliant in terms of taking drugs, whether it's because of access issues, historical issues, what, are, what have you? Um, and then, of course, applying exclusions in number three. So these are all kind of the preventive components that you can start to identify a cohort or a segment of your population that could be at risk of RA or not only at risk of RA, but also at risk of being non-compliant if they're at risk of RA. And then on the left side, the bottom left, four, five, and six, uh, these are uh, prospective uh, components. So these can be actually part of your uh, prospective uh, measurements that you do with that, whether it's through your HEDIS engine or otherwise. Uh, but here, as soon as an encounter happens where there's a diagnosis of RA, how do you track? What do you do uh, once that encounter happens and there's evidence that there is a diagnosis of RA? What are the communications that happen subsequently uh, with the attributed providers for that given membership that has the diagnosis? And how do you communicate? What do you communicate? And then ultimately, how do you acquire the necessary uh, data to close the gap uh, with proper evidence uh, around RA? So this can be done, again, uh, uh, prospectively throughout the year. Uh, combined with the preventive components you see on the right around, around models. And in fact, even other models such as risk of falls uh, can be utilized in this process and address other uh, measures uh, through Haas or what have you. So I think year round, uh, taking actions both uh, from a probabilistic standpoint as well as a statistical standpoint uh, through prospective uh, runs I think can truly impact uh, your ART population, and more importantly, improving the health uh, of those uh, of those uh, about the age of 65 with rheumatoid arthritis. So, with that, so, let's let's go to our uh, key takeaways 
um, and we started off with what were the things in the industry and we went through how they're really forcing a disruption and uh, thinking about then the key disruptive techniques that you could use. The question becomes, Shatang here, where do you start? And so we saw in the beginning, people were interested in the, the data in, uh, which is a very smart place to start. How do you collect that data? And then how do you leverage that data with the clinical um, AI models? They were interested in both the data enrichment piece and the measurement uh, KPIs, which makes a ton of sense. So as you collect the data, let's get the value out of it in terms of the measurement. Um, and I think as we go forward, people will start to see how do I then optimize my workflow and engagement that are coming out of there. So what would be your recommendation uh, for somebody who's uh, listening to this of where they should start and how they should think about their next steps in their journey uh, as, as they uh, think about what they should strategically approach? Yeah, and I think, uh, so in general, these four categories certainly help you understand where to start, right? And as you mentioned, data enrichment being a key piece. Here, it's not just about, you know, having, uh, let's say, a cloud infrastructure or, or, or not having a cloud or a traditional data warehouse. It's about getting the right data in and having the flexibility to bring that data in, normalize it, and utilize it in your, in your processes. So whether that can be done with modernized technologies like streaming analytics uh, or uh, whether you do it uh, through things like NLP, uh, the key is to have the flexibility. Um, th so that's the first place I would start is to understand what are my capabilities from an infrastructure standpoint and within, within that construct and within those capabilities, what can I truly achieve? Uh, the second thing I would focus on is how and where am I getting the data from, which is back to my provider relationship, um, and how can I make sure I have true intimate partnerships uh, with my providers. Uh, obviously, if there's an HIE in the state or other mechanism where I'm getting uh, HL7 messages, great. But what if you don't? You should really need to have creative partnerships set up with the folks you're getting the data from, especially the clinical data that can be enriched. And, and, and come up with ways where you can have more than just claims information being exchanged. Um, and then ultimately, and Jeff, I'll, I'll just kind of make a couple of points as we're one minute away. Ultimately, quality improvement is truly being disrupted because there are other business processes that are using quality improvement, meaning the value-based contracts. So your network management function is now dependent on HEDIS and quality management or STAR measures. Your customer service function because of consumerism is now dependent on where do I need to close my gaps and where do I capture, how do I capture member experience to make it better so that my scores can reflect appropriately. So all these pieces, all these different business processes that were separate traditionally are all coming together now uh, for the purpose of, of, of improving not only the quality and the performance of, of clinical quality, but also the experience of the given members. So thinking about disruption holistically, thinking about AIML to, uh, to basically improve your existing processes is gonna become more and more important as we progress. Yeah, Shutan, I think that last point that you made uh, it, it is very important for people to think about in terms of that broader strategy for the whole organization. And the industry is pushing towards changes that are involving multiple aspects of uh, quality, risk, care, uh, bringing them together. So bringing your strategies together to drive the improvement across these, I think that comment's spot on. Now, with that said, we're now at the top of the hour. I wanted to thank everybody for attending. We were intending to take a bunch of questions, uh, but apparently Shatang and I talked too much. I apologize for that. Um, but hopefully you found <laughs> it uh, interesting. <laughs> now it's all good. I uh, found it interesting. If you do have questions that you want to answer, and we've gotten a few uh, through the chat box, we're well, happy to answer them offline. Um, and um, I wanted to thank you for your attendance today. I found the conversation informative uh, and learned a lot from you, Shatang. Hopefully everybody else learned a lot from us as, as well. Thank you all for your time. Much appreciated. Thank you. And to our speakers, thank you for that great presentation and for sharing your thoughts. Thank you to our audience for participating in today's webinar. And this concludes today's presentation. Thank you again and enjoy the rest of your day.